Good morning, church. We're in the Gospel of Matthew this morning. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. It's been good to uh, be moving into Whangarei. We want to, especially on behalf of my family, I'd like to express extreme gratitude, thankfulness for all that you folks have done to make us feel at home being able to simply drive up a driveway to a house where we'll be living instead of having to stay in more motels and uh, continue to live out of suitcases and all that stuff which we had pretty much had enough of by the time we got here. Uh, To move into a place which has been furnished and taken care of for us, we really have appreciated uh, the kindness and the hospitality of all those of you that have participated in making it as smooth as possible for us uh, on our arrival here. So thank you very much for that. Well, uh, just so that you can find out a little bit more about us, uh, I am from, as you well know, South Africa, uh, from Cape Town in particular. Has anybody been to Cape Town? Okay, all right, all right. So you know the big rock in the center of Cape Town known as Table Mountain. We live just underneath that rock somewhere. And um, yeah, that's where we have been pastoring for the last five years. My wife, who you were introduced to earlier on, Laura, in English, Laura in Spanish. Uh, She's from Colombia, South America. And uh, we met one another while we were both in the United States of America. We were at one of our Adventist supporting ministries health institution. It was called the Wildwood Lifestyle Center and Hospital. We spent a number of years there uh, in the medical missionary work and on mission trips all over the place, including uh, Eastern Europe, the country of Ukraine, South Africa, all over the place that we got to to travel and to preach and to teach and to share on the concepts of health and on the concepts of the gospel. And uh, that was just before um, we accepted the call back to South Africa, where we served for five years. And well, now we're here and continuing. So we are looking forward to serving along with you and to serving this church as well as the larger district and trust that we will form good friendships and that we'll work together for the sake of the gospel and for those out there outside of these doors who have not yet heard the things that have changed your lives. And uh, this is our mission. This is our purpose is to share what God has shared with us. And so I thought to set the tone for what I hope will be the experience of the Whangarei Church, the experience of those who walk in through the front doors on a Sabbath to check us out. You know, maybe they've been listening to us on 3AVN radio, which I've taken quite a a liking to. In in, uh, South Africa, we didn't have the radio channels. We only had the television channels uh, because of uh, bandwidth challenges and frequency challenges and Christianity challenges and all that kind of stuff. We didn't have the radios, but... uh, We had the television stations, and um, obviously we are trusting and believing that God is going to lead you to touch others' hearts and lives, that God is going to lead others whom His Spirit is working with through the front doors of that church, of this church here, and what will it be like for them as they come in through here. It's amazing as we consider this topic that I'm going to share with you how it is always shrouded in controversy. It is so today, and it was so in the time of Christ. The background to the passage that we'll read in a moment is controversy. The scribes and the Pharisees are out to get Jesus. Uh, He has told a parable of a certain wedding feast. They didn't like it very much. It spoke directly to them, to their failings, to their challenges. And so they try to booby trap him. They set up a nice little scenario in which he was sure to fall. And so the Sadducees came his way with the whole story of the resurrection. I'm sure you know that story. Guy uh, who has a wife who dies, his brother, the next brother, the next brother. And so it goes down the line seven times. Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? Interesting question because the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection in any case, which is a sure giveaway to the fact that they are simply trying to trap him. He, of course in the skill that he has under the influence of the Spirit, negotiates his way out of that trap 
turning it back on themselves. And then the Pharisees come at it. Now, of course, the scribes and the Pharisees, if you know anything about them, were arch enemies. They were nemesis. They didn't like each other one little bit. But it's amazing how a common enemy will bind two previous enemies together in one, at least for the duration of the battle. So the scribes and the Pharisees who hate one another, who bicker amongst one another, who have nothing to do with one another, who look down on one another, are unified now in the common enemy, which is Jesus. Because Jesus threatens them, both of these groups, in the same way. He threatens to take their position. He threatens to take their power. He's already taking their popularity. And so he becomes the, 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 the uniting factor amongst these enemies as they seek to trap him. So the Sadducees have their go. They fail. The Pharisees come at him. And a lawyer comes his way. Now, I don't know when last you try to argue with a good lawyer. But you know it's a losing battle, right? So a lawyer comes, it says here in verse 34, when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, now don't miss this. If he is a lawyer, his training is in what? Law. So is it any surprise that Jesus gets asked a question about law? <laughs> I mean, this is his expertise, right? This is his field of knowledge. And don't forget that law in those days, just like, mm, it's maybe a bit of a bad example, but have you heard of Sharia law in the Muslim faith? The idea that the Quran becomes the civil and the legislative law for the country, that when you are in transgression of the Quran, the civil authorities step in and punish that law. Are you familiar with what I'm saying? When we're talking about the law here, this lawyer was not versed in Roman law or Roman Dutch law or whatever type of laws we use today. What was he versed in? He was versed in the Old Testament law, right? The Torah, the, the, the five books of Moses, the prophets. The, the, the law to the Jew, to the Hebrew mind, was what? Scripture. Everything was based on that. All their other laws were based on that. So when a lawyer came to you in those days and argued the law, what was he going to argue? He wasn't going to use Roman law. That was the law of the enemy, right? That was the law of the oppressor. What was true law? The, 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 the Torah, right? The Bible. So when this lawyer within the sect of the Pharisees, a Jewish sect, comes to argue law with Jesus, he's coming to argue scripture. Have we got that clear? Okay. So then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? That is a trick question. It doesn't matter which way you go with that question. You are in trouble. Because to exalt one above the other is to reduce the others below the one you choose. Which is the great law of the, or which is the greatest of the commandments in the law? So Jesus said to him, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest of commandments. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. What an answer. <laughs> what was he saying? In essence, Jesus was saying that all law boils down to one principle. It is impossible to distinguish between the greatness of this law or that law over one, one or the other when you understand that all law is a manifestation of one great principle. And that is the principle of love. You see, when you get the principle of love, all other law takes its rightful place in that context. 
There is no, this law is greater, that's law. Well, if you're going to break one, break this one because that's less important. Well, the Sabbath, now the Sabbath is the one you really want to make sure you get right. If you get the lying wrong, that's okay as long as you get the Sabbath right. You know, if you, it, it just, just don't use the Lord's name in vain. Don't bow down to idols. You know, those four there, those, those, those ones are the first part of the commandments. Don't get those wrong. If you happen to compromise in any of the others having to do with your relationships with other people, that's okay, but don't get any of the first four wrong. There are certain, in our minds, hierarchies of law, different places, different things, more important than other things. Jesus says it is impossible to distinguish between which is the greatest of law on that level when you understand that they're all manifestation of exactly the same thing, which is the law of love. So whether you break this one or whether you break that one, you are transgressing the great law of love. Now, love is a popular theme in our world today. We love to talk about love, don't we? We love to talk about the love of God. We do not like it when people start to talk to us about law because law implies right or wrong. If we start talking about right or wrong and I happen to be on the wrong side of that, then I feel condemned and you are judging me and we don't like to talk about law. We all like to speak about love. And that mentality that exists in our world today tells me that we have neither grasped law nor love. We have neither grasped the concept of love, neither have we grasped the concept of law. Because when a lawyer came to Jesus to test him on the law, he answered him, love. In Jesus' mind, that mean, meaning what? That law and love were synonymous with one another. There was no differentiation in the mind of God, in the mind of Christ, between the concept of law and the concept of love. To transgress law was to transgress love. To break the principle of love means that in some area of law, transgression would happen as well. The idea that the love of God is what we must talk about and ignore the concept of law because that implies right and wrong tells us that we think of love on a superficial Hollywood definition of warm, fuzzy feelings. You know, if you feel good towards someone, that's love. Question, can you love someone who you feel no warm, fuzzy feelings for? Can you? Anybody got teenagers? <laughs> you see, love is far broader than a warm, fuzzy feeling. Love is a principle of action. The Ten Commandments as well as the rest of the Torah, the Ten Commandments as well as the rest of the writings of Scripture, Jesus says, hangs, depends on, is intertwined with, inseparably uh, joined together with the concept of love. Love is the one principle that flows from the beginning of Scripture right through the end, through the judgments of God, through the law of God, through the love of God. Everything is tied together with what? Love. I like the way one person once illustrated this. Going back to the original instance where the Ten Commandments were given. And you know, we're told in the world today and amongst Christians that, you know, the Ten Commandment law was invented by Moses at Mount Sinai, right? That it was there that the law was given, that prior to this it did not exist, and that it was really just for the Jews in their time and so on and so forth. And you ask yourself the question, what was it that was transgressed? What was it that was broken in the in, in the, the, the Garden of Eden, way back when, if the transgression of the law is sin, then there must have been sin back then, right? So we know as Adventists how we reason through this whole thing, etc., etc. But have you ever wondered to yourself, why were the Ten Commandments given at Sinai in the form that they were given? Is it true that they did not exist before? When you go back to the, what the words of Jesus, what he writes here, you will understand very clearly how it is that the Ten Commandment law existed in the Garden of Eden, although it was never written down. Why would God need to write down and define 
to a race of perfect beings just born from the Creator's hands, without any blight of sin upon their moral characters, without any dulling of their intelligence, being exposed to the very presence of God, designed with the moral compass embedded in them, why would He need to define to them what the definition of love is? To a race of perfect beings, it was very easy to simply say, you shall love me. <coughs> you will love me with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Is that not what Jesus has just said here? What is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. What's the common denominator in both of those commandments? <coughs> the word love, right? The word love. So back in the Garden of Eden where God creates humanity, brings them into existence, what had he embedded in their heart? The knowledge and the experience of love. The entire Ten Commandments were built in to Adam and Eve. Why did he need to give it at Mount Sinai in the form that he did? Because after 430 years of slavery, now living in New Zealand, I doubt that any of you have ever experienced abject slavery. But living under the yoke of the Egyptians for 430 years, under pharaohs, in the midst of idolatry, amongst people who sought to destroy, kill, and eliminate the Hebrew people. What did they know of the love of God when they left Egypt? Nothing, right? We know this because of their complaining. We know this because every time they came up against a hard situation, they turned against God and against his leaders because they did not know the love of God. If they knew the love of God, there would be no question. When we face the Red Sea, when we face the enemy, who's going to come to our rescue? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm still trying to get over a cold. <coughs> Which some New Zealanders shared with me. <laughs> they would have known when they came up against a hard place that who was going to bail them out? God himself. If he had said to them at Mount Sinai, I have one prerequisite and one prerequisite only, that you what? Love me, number one, supremely, and that you love one another. They would have gone, yeah, that's okay. We know how to do that. We can love one another. And they would have continued in their old ways. So God says to them, listen. Let's make this real simple. Here are ten basic principles. These ten principles is what love looks like. I'm going to make it real simple for you. I'm going to describe to you, if you love me, this is what it will look like. And if you love one another, this is what it will look like. First four commandments defining our relationship to God. The first four commandments governing our relationship with God. Because if you love God, you're not going to have any other gods before Him, right? You're not going to cheat on Him spiritually with other, with other so-called gods. If you love God supremely, you're not going to try and bring Him down from what He is to, to formulate Him in your narrow conception of what God might look like by, by bowing down to some image made in your image from what you can comprehend, thus confining Him to your little box of understanding. You see, if you, allow, if you love God, you will let Him be what He is, far greater than what you can comprehend. If you love God, you will treat His holy name with intense reverence and respect. Those things we hear on television, which I, which I hear people speaking in common society. 
You know, I, when I sometimes catch a movie or when I'm listening to people out on the street, I am not so much offended by those four-letter words. You know which ones I'm talking about, right? <coughs> but the ones that really hurt my ears are the ones where the name of God is taken in vain. And it's interesting to me when we watch television how that on a movie that's rated for language or a movie that has the bad words blotted out, you know what I mean, those movies where they kind of beep them out or silence them out or whatever the case may be, the movies that are approved for children will have no swearing in terms of the four-letter words, but they will have the blasphemous words. Isn't that an irony? And I think to myself, I would far rather have my child exposed, if I had to choose, of course, to the four-letter words than to the misuse of the name of God. You see, if I love God, I will cherish His name because it means something to me. It's the name by which I'm saved. It's the name by which I'm called. It's the name that means redemption for me. And if I have respect for that name, my life will show it so that when I take His name upon me, calling myself Christian, follower of Christ, my life and my character will not be like the devil. Because we not only take the Lord's name in vain through our words, but through the profession of following God when we openly turn our backs on Him. That too is taking the Lord's name in vain. And of course, if I love God, I will cherish every moment with Him. And He has defined a 24-hour space in time in which nothing else is to interfere. Our entire focus is to be a spiritual focus in which we look upon the face of God. We spend time meditating, communing with Him through nature, through fellowship, through the Word, through prayer, through all these, these different modes and mod uh, ways of communing with God. If we love God supremely, we will allow nothing else to come between us and God spending time with one another in that spiritual date once a week called the seventh day Sabbath. God moves on to the relationship with, with, uh, with fellow human beings, those last six commandments, and he starts with the one that stands right next to our relationship with God, and that is our relationship with our parents. First on the list of how we're to govern, what the, what the concept of love looks like is within the home on a horizontal level. Children, you will honor your father and your mother. And children can be 60 years old. Are you with us? Not just teenagers, not just those below the teens. As long as you have parents, you are a child. And we will honor our father and our mother. We, if, if we truly love one another, we will not bear false witness against one another. We will not steal from one another. We will not cheat with one another's partners. We will not murder one another, either literally or with the tongue, through gossip. And we will be content, not constantly chasing after the Joneses. What they have, I must have. That's the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not be like the Joneses. Forgive me if there's a Jones here. You hear what I'm saying? He says to a bunch of slaves at Mount Sinai, you don't have a clue what love is. I always use, I realize this is a delicate uh, illustration, and I use it with respect and, and gentleness, but imagine in your mind a child, a young child, who has been in an abusive home, a sexually abusive home, all they have ever known is sexual abuse. Are you with me? And every time this little girl or this little boy or whatever it was is abused by their mommy and by their daddy, they're told, this is love. Daddy loves you. This is, how we, this is what we do and we love each other. Are you with me? What does that child know about love? Unless something radical happens in that young child's life as they grow to maturity, they will more than likely live out those very actions, though it leaves them guilt-ridden, though it leaves them broken, though it leaves them unfulfilled, though somewhere deep inside of them they know there's something wrong here, that is the definition of love. 
when they later on pursue relationships at teenage years and, and so on and so forth going forward, what will most likely be the scenario, unless something breaks that cycle and something shifts in the mind and the heart, most likely the relationships that they define as loving relationships will probably be codependent, sexually abusive relationships. Because that's what love is. That's what was programmed into the mind and the mentality. Until somebody comes along and demonstrates true, unselfish, godly love, and the scales fall off the eyes and they say, wait a second, I was deceived. That was not love. 430 years in slavery, the chosen people of God are called out of the land of slavery. And God says to them, in essence, at Mount Sinai, all I need for you to do is love me supremely and love one another. That is your calling. That is your mission. That is what it means to be the chosen people, to love like I love. Oh, okay, sure, that makes sense. They didn't have a clue. And so God defined what love looks like. He gave it in the form of the Ten Commandments. Love is defined in the context of human relationships with God, with one another, as the Ten Commandments. This artificial differentiation between let's talk about the love of God and not so much about the law of God is just that. It is artificial. You cannot, when you understand the love of God, misunderstand the law of God. And when you understand the law of God, you cannot help but marvel at the love of God. Because it, one defines the other. Love is not merely the warm, fuzzy feelings that we have towards one another. Now let me try and, ex let me try and break this down a little bit more for you. Let's take the issue of adultery, just because it's a very simple one to illustrate. You get married, you're in love with one another, a few years down the line, so on and so forth. You meet somebody else. You start to experience feelings inside of you. They're strong feelings. They're feelings of attraction. They're hormonal feelings. You know the feelings I'm talking about, right? A little bit like when you were a teenager, when you met the person you married. Those feelings of attraction. You leave your wife or your husband because you realize you don't love them. You love the other person. That's the danger of thinking of love simply as warm, fuzzy feelings. Because feelings fluctuate and feelings change. And feelings are never constant nor stable. If you base your experience on feelings, you will be led up the garden path and around the mulberry bush a thousand times. By the way, the same is true of your relationship with God. If your relationship with God is based on warm, fuzzy feelings, sometimes you'll think you're close to God, and at other times, you'll think that God's abandoned you. Because feelings change. You see, those feelings we have to people who are not our partners outside of the, the right context, etc., etc., it's called lust, not love. Big difference between lust and love. So God helps us understand. When you are in a relationship like this, and you start to feel like there are strong feelings that may mean you love somebody else instead of your partner, God has given you a commandment that helps you understand and discern between what is love and what is not love. Does that make sense to you? When you have to start being deceptive in your relationships and you think you're doing it out of love, God helps you understand by giving you a commandment that is not how love treats others. Does that make sense to you? You see, this is not just a theoretical sermon this morning. It's deeply practical. And what I want to challenge you to today is to use some portion of the Sabbath whether it's out on a nature walk or sitting on your veranda, your balcony or whatever it is, and you're sitting, just meditate on those Ten Commandments in the context of what Jesus says. That the greatest of all commandments is love. Love first to God, love second 
to human beings. Re, re uh, organ me. Because that's all that God has called you and I to. When you and I learn to love like he has called us to love, the world will be a changed place. When you and I learn to love like God has called us to love, this mission that Adventists for 160-something years have been trying our best to fulfill will be fulfilled very rapidly. Because when you and I have learned to love the way God has called us to love, we will reflect the character that he has promised. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. When people walk in through the front door on a Sabbath morning and we have learned to love like Christ has called us to love, they will not walk out the back door. When we have learned to love like God has called us to love, we will not only be warm and fuzzy on the outside, but we will be deep, authentic, caring on the inside. When we've learned to love like God has called us to love, we will not only be interested in, in welcoming people and making them feel at home, but we will be a people who have perfected holiness in the fear of God. Because all true love is in the context of obedience. You see, love and obedience are not two separate contexts. Our church is sometimes polarized by those who are trying their best to be perfect. And those who are trying their best to be loving and friendly, they need to come together. <laughs> because in Christ, the two are one. The perfect obedience to the commandments is what? Perfect love for God. Serious vices. Does that make sense? You can be a real friendly person and everyone thinks you nice and warm and loving while you're sleeping around and messing around and lying and cheating. And Does that make sense to you? Because in the world's eyes, friendliness equals love. By biblical definition, obedience and love are the same thing. The two do not exist apart from one another. Because the greatest 